Musique by Barry McKinley. London, August 1979. Mac and Kevin stood in the Young Ireland ballroom and studied the strange gyrating creatures. There was nothing even remotely attractive to the eye in the posturing and the prancing and the posing. But that didn't matter, because Mac and Kevin hadn't come for the dancing, nor to pick up heavy girls and transport them into a state of blissful matrimony. They were certainly not there for the music. They were looking for one particular inbred face in a vast sea of many. One, a two, a one, two, three said the Queen of Irish Country Music as she dropped the microphone stand to its lowest notch. She wore a sequined jacket with a collar so big it looked like someone had tried to slice off her head with a boomerang. <laughs> testing, testing, testing! The dance hall in Harlston was run by a pea-faced priest called Father Hegarty, a breeder of hard-working man-horses. He poked and prodded his sires into action on Friday and Saturday nights. The whole romantic enterprise was based on the fact that half the paddies in London hoped to marry a fat little nurse from Mayo, a flush-cheeked, bosomy creature with a forgiving nature and a functional knowledge of fellatio. It was more grapple than dance, uh, with men and women drunkenly whirling about the floor like disparate, desperate <laughs> items of clothing in a tumble dryer. <laughs> Mix and match. The Queen of Irish Country Music stood in front of an old slide projection of an Irish street scene circa 1950. A retarded population, scared in equal measure by God and fashion. Their clothes made from rags dipped in bog water. Their cars, the mechanical biscuit tins inherited from the English. Morris Cowleys, assorted Cambridges and Rileys, and the never faithful Austin 10. What you call a British car owner? A fucking pedestrian. <laughs> Max said something, and Kevin nodded. They both focused on the same ugly misshapen man on the other side of the dance floor. Mandy McKenna. It was not a pretty sight. He had pork chop ears and a beak for a nose. He was the brother you preferred not to talk about. The uncle you rarely saw. The child you hoped you'd never have. <laughs> he was the fetus that somehow made it past the coat hanger. <laughs> he nodded at Mac and Kevin and then stepped out onto the warm maple floor where most of his business transactions took place. Her Royal Highness, the Queen of Twang, tightened the knob on the microphone stand and then snapped her fingers. With an amplified clickety-clack, the band pranced onto the stage, all indigo costumes and fat calloused hands. They looked less like musicians and, and more like the stokers on a queer cruise ship. Some old spit was drained from the water key on the alto sax and a mewling tone was pulled from the sagging lung of a button accordion. How are ya? roared the Queen. Grand! The crowd roared back. If you thought the worst thing the Irish ever did to London was to put a bomb in Harrods, then you have never heard Mary McCrory's mystical men. <laughs> or Danny Driscoll and his Mullingar moonshiners. Or Chipper O'Neill and the boys from the barracks as they gang raped the Nashville songbook. <laughs> testing, testing, one, two, three! Mandy had taken his name from the Irish tradition of calling a man after his chosen profession. For instance, Martin Minibus Brennan, the plumber Foley, Whoremaster Dooley and so on. Mandy was a retailer of Mandrax pills, what, what the Sun newspaper referred to as Randy Mandy's and the Americans called Quaaludes. He sold them for a quid apiece. Mac and Kevin 
waded through the roughnecks in their brine nylon shirts and pushed through the stench of brew cream originally that hung in the air like mustard gas. Testing, testing, seven, eight, nine! The pair cut deeper through the crowd into the ugly heart of the mob where the fight was most likely to start. Well, lads, Mandy said, when they came to face, when they came face to face. Well, 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 well. He was a fountain of wells. Money was handed over and Mandy yelled through cupped hands, You'll have to go and see Pawdy now. Pawdy has the gear. You know Pawdy, don't you? And everyone knew Pawdy. Pawdy hailed from some pit in County Roscommon where they made pies out of sick children. <laughs> he talked through a scattering of crooked teeth and his words came out in short, mangled sentences. Mandy disappeared into a hedgerow of corduroy jackets and shiny-ass gabardine pants. Kevin pushed forward too until he was swallowed, but Mac found his path blocked by a giant in a dun-coloured three-piece suit. The monster wore a necktie with a knot the size of a clenched fist. His clenched fists were the size of bowling balls. The only reason he had developed opposable thumbs was because he needed them to operate a shuffle. <laughs> Excuse me, Mac said, but the monster refused to budge. What are you doing here? The monster bellowed. And it was a reasonable question because Mac did not look like he belonged anywhere. Ramon's jeans, shark skin jacket, and a knockoff Westwood t shirt that said, Heroin only kills the weak. <laughs> his hair was spiked and prickly to the touch, his eyes darkened by sleepless nights and bad romantic judgment. He always carried a knife. A tortured note rang out from the stage, and the three piece drum kit kicked into life. Kish, kish, went the hi hat. I asked you a question, said the monster. The bass guitar climbed to a cruising altitude where it would remain for the rest of the night, repeating the exact same phrase, something that sounded like the words Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty, over and over again. Tish, tish, Humpty Dumpty, tish, tish. The queen of Irish country music started to sing, and her Donegal accent crept through the air, a dissonant flatulence gassing a song that had four words, three chords, and no earthly reason for existence. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you again! Mac looked up into the eyes of the sideburned sociopathic sister shagger and saw a walnut-sized brain and a 40-watt bulb with one illuminated thought. When the band starts playing, the fighting starts! <laughs> for one short moment, Mac felt a twinge of sorrow, not for the monster and the terrible tragedy that was about to befall him, but for the loss of his own musical youth. Punk rock arrived in 76 and departed in 77. The anthems could now only be heard after midnight, Radio echoes, zombie love calls, rippled with static. The opening scream of neat, 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 mixed with the broken china cup piano of Piss Factory. White noise rising over the airwaves and disappearing into the darkness of time. Punk was dead. And yet this shite was alive. <laughs> Out with the new and in with the old. There was no justice in the world of song. Answer me! roared the monster, wrapping Mac's chest with a bowling ball fist. Some frothy saliva spun out from his face, a liquid question mark that accompanied his violent curiosity. Tish, tish, humpty dumpty, tish, tish! The din was gnawing into Mac's head like a hungry rat. He thought of the chip shop in Wood Green and the jukebox full of rock classics. Yeah, Johann Sebastian Zeppelin and Ludwig van Bachmann Turner Overdrive. <laughs> and the little Greek girl behind the counter who used the phrase, My love. In every single sentence, in a soft voice that sometimes gave him an erection. 
<laughs> a stiffness of diction, you might say. <laughs> will, will you like salt on that, my love? And then she would dip her delicate hand into the heated glass case that contained the thick, juicy sausage of kings. A squirt of ketchup on your savloin, my love? One day, he might ask her out. But he had very little exposure to Greek women and was concerned about their genetic predisposition towards facial hair. <laughs> One did not want to fall asleep beside Melina Mercury and wake up next to Freddie Mercury. <laughs> I'm talking to you! Howled the monster. The crowd pressed in and the knife sneaked out. It was an old American shawl snap with a black tar handle and a sweet stiletto blade, not yet extended. It was easily concealed in a hand. Mac looked past the 40-watt fight bulb into the shallow pool of the big man's knowledge. He saw a grey soup filled with Republican songs, decades of the rosary, pictures of Elvis Presley and Padre Pio, secret homosexual longings, recipes for rasher sandwiches, Gaelic football scores in 62, and last but by no means least, the list of fake names used in different labour exchanges for fraudulent claims. Kish, kish, humpty dumpty, kish, kish. Mac pressed the button and the blade swung out, a sharp secret hidden by the passing movement of bodies. He had already picked his target. The monster's belly looked like a laundry sack filled with wet cement. It heaved, swayed and rolled from side to side. It rubbed against a rayon shirt, generating static, forcing short hairs out through buttonholes where they became charged tendrils, arcing and sparking against a belt buckle the size of a hubcap. <laughs> Max smiled. The monster opened his mouth to say something loud, noxious and fearsome. But the words never came. Instead, his eyes turned to water, his knees bent and his shoulders folded in like butterfly wings. He descended into the quicksand of pain with a twisted face and quivering lips, and when he hit the ground, it was with a sodden thump. Kish, kish, umpty, dumpty, kish, kish. And Mac was perplexed because the knife still hung at his side, bright and shining and clean as a whistle. The belly of the beast was still intact with no guts, no gore spilled on the floor. Something else entirely had brought about the dramatic collapse of Goliath. A boot had cut through the tangle of chances and dancers and slammed into the monster's shin, crushing it like a one-stem vase caught in the path of a ball-peen hammer. The boot belonged to Kevin. His face bobbed into view for a second, bright, tight, and energized. Somebody bash Dinny! The call went out. Tell Danny somebody bash Dinny! Danny and Dinny, a, a pair of brothers or, or a comedy duo, a woman screamed. The glass shattered. Who bashed Dinny? The crowd searched itself for the enemy within, for the basher of Dinny. Bouncers <laughs> took to the floor, four abreast, like minesweepers. Father Hegarty, his bald head speckled with rainbow dots from the mirror ball, put down a bottle of warm 7-Up, rolled up his black sleeves and waded into the mayhem. Kevin's hand reached out and dragged Mac through an opening at the swirling chaos. Pordy leaned against a column, not even vaguely interested in the war waging all around him. When he saw Mac and Kevin approach, he pulled a plastic bag from his pocket. Where's Port the fuck? he said, making sense only to himself. His hand touched Kevin's hand and the deal was done with speed accuracy and near invisibility. Mac and Kevin headed for the exit. The queen of Irish country music crooned into the vortex of raging testosterone. A tale of happy girlhood spent in buttercup pastures. The accordion player stepped nervously back from the edge of the stage. The drummer scrunched up and made himself a smaller target for the flying bottles. Kish, kish, humpty dumpty, kish, kish. Mac and Kevin made it to the door without further adventure, and just as they hit the fresh outside air, a young lady arrived, the original of the species, the puffy, little, full-breasted Mayo 
nurse herself. All handbag and hairspray and hope. <laughs> and when she caught sight of two young men departing, two fine catches, she moaned in abject disappointment. Unable to contain her woe, she watched them go into the black London night. And her voice was small and helpless, the involuntary words almost lost in the racket and the riot coming from inside the ballroom. Ah, lads, you're not leaving already. <laughs>